Hello, my name is Carla, and my group today will be presenting on lipids and fats. Um, our subtopics will be dietary fat recommendation needs for children, which will be presented for, by me, Carla. Um, dietary fat and risk for various cancers by Kayla, omega-3 fatty acid, and treatment for prevention of diseases by Christian, and fatty replacements used in the food industry by Yesenia. Um, to start off, I did my article on dietary fat acids during adolescent stage. Um, the study aims to describe prospective associations of fatty acid intakes during their childhood with changes in serum lipids concentrations during adolescence, um, therefore considers changes in blood lipids during the theoretical reduction of the saturated fatty acids. Um, the hypothesis of this study was that by changing saturated fatty acids into different nutrients, the serum lipid levels would drop in the adolescent's life stage. Um, this study was the, the different nutrient they chose to go with was carbohydrate instead of the saturated fatty for the different groups they chose. Um, the participants, there was a total of 1,398 participants, which were all German. Um, there were 717 males and 681 females. The participants were recruited since they were born, since um, they had to be healthy full-term newborns. They were chosen um, right in their obstetrician off clinics and the pre-requirements were the approval of the family and the local ethics community approvals. Um, the study. Um, the study was a, co a cohort study, which is a longitudinal study, which also serves people over a certain period of time. Um, in this study specifically, they studied the, <clears throat> the growing up spaces. So from like newborn to like teenage years. Um, specifically, they did two follow-ups. They did a 10th year follow-up and a 15 year follow-up. In the 10th year follow-up, they did uh, blood samples which were obtained um, to measure cholesterol, low density, blood protein, high density lipoprotein, and drink glycerate levels. And they also had physical examinations and they had a self-administered food frequency questionnaires to collect the food and nutrient intake, which basically was like a self-assessment, a proximity of like the food the um, participant had eating in the past year so they could get like, um, an idea of like the body mass and like different types of like body intakes of the person. Um, in the 15 year follow-up, they would basically just do another blood sample and physical examination as well. Um, participants were excluded in this study, but there was only two main reasons why they would be excluded. They would either be excluded because they didn't have um, they had their blood samples were like in the outliers. So I mean, it's like, for example, if like a person had like a higher cholesterol, like normally than other participants, so it wouldn't like be in the mean range. So they wouldn't like incorporate that. There was also um, times where they were, they were exclude people because of their dietary restrictions or their medical restrictions. An example would be like um, medical restriction would be like the person had be, had become, um, Di diabetic over the time or like they had a medical condition and yeah and then a dietary meal restriction would be like um the person became lactose and they couldn't like have a normal um a normal diet like the rest of the participants um some of the findings were that um those those who didn't um replace the saturated fatty acids with the carbohydrates, so they were the sing singular um, single nutrient model. They did not have a correlation with the body lipids in pubertal stage. I mean, it's like their blood, um, when they were, their blood samples, when they were measured, they didn't have like high, a high cholesterol or high um, low density lipoprotein. But for the, for the substitution one, um, Specifically in the females, there was an increase in triglycerides, low density lipoprotein, and high density lipoprotein. And the triglycerides. 
Um, some of the strengths and limitations. One of the strengths of this study is the development of diseases throughout life stages. So specifically, that means like this study was able to, the study being a cohort study was able to like study um, people like growing up specifically so they could see like how diseases um, grow up with them, like you could say, because specifically like you would be, they would become older with the disease so that the disease would like travel with them specifically. Um, limitations was um, that a disadvantage of the study is a loss of study population used and under and the underrepresentation. So specifically that means like study population, the loss would be like because of the medical, the medical um, problems or like they became lactose intolerant. Um, same thing would be like there was no follow-ups back from the from the calls they would get. And underrepresentation specifically just means that it can't be a generalized study because it specifically uh, wasn't representing like all population. So for, his, uh, for example, um, this was just German. So they wouldn't have um, the same diet as like other countries, for example. Um, some conclusions and takeaway. Uh, in conclusion, the study, the study finding insinuates the higher levels of saturated fatty acids lowers triglycerides concentration during the stage life of adolescence, and then sex-based determinants play a bigger role during adolescence, and created different conclusions for each gender based on the pubertal stage. The substitution of carbohydrates for saturated fatties increased levels of triglycerides, low-density lipoprotein, and high-density lipoprotein in females. Uh, specifically, this just means that like um, throughout different stages of the life of the participants, they all tested differently, uh, specifically like um, being like a female um, or a male during uh, adolescence age, it, it um, created different um, results. And then some of these search uh, takeaways can be like these um, findings can can be applied to like um, the studies of cardiovascular diseases and teenage diseases that affect that are being affected during adulthood. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to be introducing our topic for our PowerPoint presentation on lipids and fats in relation to its effect on the increased risk for breast cancer. My name is Kayla and I'm going to be speaking on the study about premenopausal fat intake and risk of breast cancer. High intake so far has been associated with an increased risk of breast cancer in other studies. To start off, I am going to describe the two different types of fat. The first one is unsaturated fat, which is liquid at room temperature, mostly in plants but also can be found in seeds and fishes. It is shown to improve blood cholesterol levels, ease inflammation, and stabilize heart rhythms. These factors are important when maintaining a heart health because of how much of these fats can impact overall health. The second type of fat is saturated fat, which is a solid at room temperature and found in in a majority of animal products and is in food such as pizza, cheese, cookies, and fast food. This type of fat is mainly found in unhealthy food that are very greasy and salty and sugary. In the study, there were 116,671 female registered nurses aged 25 to 42. They had responded in a 1989 questionnaire about their medical history and lifestyles in order for the researchers to gain an understanding of them. After this, a follow-up was done in 1991, and this was when the diet was first measured. A questionnaire was sent out in 1991 and 1995, which featured 133 and 142 food items. These food items represent the types of fats that I have discussed earlier. It is important to look at the different kinds because it helps determine the relationship between an increased risk for breast cancer. 
fat intake was calculated for the individual from the sum of all the foods consumed. Food groups were examined that lead to high amounts of animal fat, such as red meat, chicken, and fish, and premenopausal women were the main focus of the study. Twice a year in 1993 and 1995, there was a questionnaire sent to identify the amount of women who develop breast cancer. Deaths were reported by family members, and if they did not receive back a questionnaire, then the researchers would look at the National Death Index. There they would check to see if the participant did not respond as results of death and would figure out the cause of deaths was breast cancer or other causes. When there was a report of breast cancer, the researchers would ask for hospital documentations in order to keep records. The researchers would then check to see if the reports were accurate to what the participants were reporting. The researchers were able to confirm with 98% accuracy that the reports they were getting were true. Due to self-reporting being so accurate, if participants were not able to verify the breast cancer, the documentation, then they counted it as another breast cancer case. At the end of the study, out of 90,655 participants, 714 had cancer within the eight-year follow-up. This study did support the hypothesis that there is a positive relationship between the amount of animal fat in the diet and breast cancer. This finding does not mean that all fat causes cancer. If the participants were receiving fat from vegetables, they were not having the same results as the animal fat. There was a positive relationship from the products such as red meat and high dairy foods. Thank you for listening to my portion of the presentation. I hope that you learned something new. <clears throat> okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Christian Torres. My group is Lipids and Fats. And my specific subtopic will be on omega-3 fatty acid and the treatment or prevention of diseases. Quick little overview. I'm going to go over the study, introduce the study. I'm going to define the purpose. I'm going to go over the methodology. I will review the results, go over conclusions, identify strengths and limitations, and uh, look at the application to the real world. So the research study that I chose was accepted in 2017 by the British Journal of Nutrition. The title is Effects of Prenatal and three fatty acid supplementation, <clears throat> excuse me, on uh, offspring resolvents at birth and 12 years of age, a double blind randomized controlled clinical trial. Uh, resolvents are specialized pro resolving mediators, <clears throat> so lipid mediators. SBMs are part of the active process of inflammation, they control that process. And uh, randomized is not misspelled, that's how they do it in Britain. All right, so the purpose of this study, uh, it, first well, I'm gonna speak on inflammation. Inflammation plays a important role in acute infection. So if you get a cut, um, it's part of that healing process, but it can be harmful in chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Uh, for this specific study, they focused on atopic eczema, eczema, the dermatitis syndrome, AIDS. So e eczema, you know, it's a skin inf inflammation caused by allergies, it's very common. And if we're talking about itis, you know, we're talking about inflammation. Uh, so that's, <clears throat> that's the disease that we're gonna be covering in this presentation and what they went over in the study. To, so the purpose is simply to determine whether maternal dietary supplementation of omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids uh, during pregnancy could modify immune responses in infants. So that's 
the purpose. Uh, methodology. Methodology, so how they conducted the study. So we know that it's a double blind randomized cl uh, controlled clinical trial, which is the gold standard of clinical research studies. So if we're evaluating the validity of the study, you know, that definitely helps its cause. Uh, it used 98 atopic pregnant women, so women that were generically predisposed to having allergic diseases or inflammation. Uh, so they got written consent from all mothers. Uh, all procedures of the study were approved by the St. John of God Hospital and Princess Margaret Hospital Human Ethics Committee. Uh, 52 women got fish oil, 46 were given the control. Um, they were given 3.7 grams of each and for 20 weeks. Uh, blood was collected from offspring at birth and at 12 years old. So core blood was collected at birth through the placenta and peripheral blood was obtained at 12 years old. Peripheral blood is just the blood that goes through our body. So it is a 12 year study and it, uh, blood was stored at negative 80 degrees Celsius. I did the conversion for you and it's a negative 112 degrees Fahrenheit for 12 years. So pretty amazing stuff. <clears throat> Data was anal analyzed using counts, percentages, means, and centers deviations as appropriate. Results. During pregnancy, 98 atopic pregnant women uh, participated. Only 83 completed the study. At birth, 83 infants were included in the study, but only 81 core blood samples were available for analysis. I'm not sure the reason. At 12 years, 58 children participated in the follow-up study, so we lost several. And I mean, after 12 years, it's kind of, you know, you can understand but only 43 blood samples were available for analysis. Again, for one reason or another, I'm not too sure. Uh, but yeah, only 43 in all. Uh, compared with the control group, with the one that got the olive oil, omega-3 fatty acid supplementation during pregnancy resulted in an increase of core blood, 18 HEPE, which is an omega-3 uh, fatty acid. Uh, and I believe it helps control uh, inflammation inflammation or pressure, pressure, sorry. Um, and we have a P value of less than 0.01%. And so P probability, probability is less than 0.01%. Uh, had an increase in 17 HDHA, which is another omega-3 fatty acid. And the probability was the same. We had a 30 to 20% increases in resolvance, uh, uh, resolvance E2, resolving E3, and again, probabilities are less than 1%, so it's not statistically significant. Conclusions. The, so the change in concentrations of the omega-3 fatty acids from birth to 12 years uh, was greater in the omega-3 fatty acid group, but after following adjustments for comparison testing, the change was no longer significant uh, so, um, after 12 years, uh, SPMs were not different in the offspring <clears throat> of women supplemented with omega-3 fatty acid compared to the offspring uh, that took the control. So, we do know that uh, omega-3 supplementation during pregnancy can influence the pattern of uh SPM production in the offspring, and this is most likely due through placental transfer. But like I mentioned before, it's not long lasting beyond the end of supplementation and further research is required to determine long-term effects. So the strengths of this study, it used atopic pregnant women, right? So they have that gene. It uses the gold standard of clinical trials. Um, it, randomization and dispensing of capsules of the, of the control and fish oil capsules. That was conducted at a different facility by different uh, researchers. So inc increases the validity on that. Participants uh, completed a FFQ, so food uh, frequency questionnaire at 20 and 30 weeks gestation, just to monitor the fish consumption. Compliance with the treatment regimen was checked at 30 and 36 weeks gestation and then six weeks after birth. Uh, so they really, making sure that participants are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And then the compre comprehensive follow-up at 12 years, um, 12 years is crazy amount of time. So any type of follow-up at 12 years is pretty, pretty, pretty good. 
limitations. So it is a relatively short uh, term supplementation, only 20 weeks. Um, and the study admits that. They also admit that it was an insufficient sample size uh, to, uh, to investigate associations with allergic outcomes in the present data. So it was less than 100 participants. Um, it is a high attrition rate of 12 years. So um, being the core blood samples being stored for that long, it could have effect on the results. Or, or, or yeah, the impact of N3 fatty acid consumption may require a longer ongoing intervention period in order to detect a difference in SPM at 12 years or older. So just short study, not enough uh, participants, and then it is high attrition rate. And lastly, the application to the real world. Uh, so the full extent of the health benefits of fish are still unclear. And you should always seek doctor's advice before taking any type of fish oil omega-3 supplement. But the American Heart Association does recommend taking some form of omega-3 supplementation, whether that be food or pills, um, because it does have uh, health, heart health benefits, especially. It reduces risk of heart attacks, strokes, reduces triglycerides. And since we're talking about inflammation, we, we saw the effect it had on infants, uh, but consistent omega-3 supplementation throughout your life uh, as an adolescent or an, a young adult, even when you're older, it can help with those long-term chronic inflammation that leads to more serious uh, uh, health issues. So whether it's food or, or supplements, uh, some form of uh, omega-3 intake is beneficial. The end. Thank you. Uh, appreciate your time. Okay. Okay. So, hi, my name is Yesenia Cruz, and my subtopic that I conducted was food replacements in the food industry. The article that I chose was called Sensory Evaluation of Unsalted French Fries Using Peanut Oil versus Unsalted French Fries Using Canola Oil. First and foremost, I want to point out some interesting facts I learned while reading through the study. According to the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, approximately 68% of American adults are overweight or obese. From ages 6 to 11, 20% um, of those are obese, and from 12 to 19, 18% are considered obese. Fast food consumption has led an increase in diseases such as overweight, stroke, heart disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, arthritis, and cancer. Mainly, I think this is because most of the time when people or consumers like myself, when we go out to eat, we never really bother to ask what exactly we it is that we are consuming. Also, 300,000 people die each year due to the relation of these diseases. Um, and last but not least, not only does this, does this increase mortality rate, it increases healthcare costs. It is estimated that Americans were 107, 147 billion in medical bills in 2008. So the procedure, um, this study was first conducted, well, first and, first, first and foremost, this study was conducted at Pennsylvania State University, uh, totally, with a total of 494 panelists. Here in table one, we are showed um, what indicates male, females, and their age versus the days that they conducted the potatoes or they fry the potatoes. Um, in table two, we are, in, we are indicated the appearance of the French fries. In table three, we are displayed the, the, the mean that we got for the taste of both the canola oil and the peanut oil. In table four, um, oh my God. We are presented the mean flavor 
of the canola oil versus the peanut oil. And in table five, we are showed um, the overall liking of both French fries using the point hedonic scale. Lastly, in this table, um, we are indicated the, the hardness of the canola oil and the hardness of the peanut oil. Okay. Resulting from these, or to get a better understanding of these tables, um, here in table two, um, we are indicated the appearance, the mean, the mean of the appearance using the nine point hedonic scale with one being extremely likable, I mean, extremely dislikable and nine being extremely likable. Um, here we can see that canola oil, canola oil rated higher than peanut oil in day 10 in appearance. Um, in table three, we are display the, the mean taste. And we can see that both canola, canola oil and peanut oil stayed consistent in terms of taste. Um, here in table four, we are presented the mean flavor. And here we can see that in day four, it, canola oil was relatively higher than peanut oil in terms of flavor. Back to table five, um, we don't really see a significant difference in either. Uh, lastly, in table six, um, we can see that there is an increase in hardness by 32.9% from December 3rd to December 15th, while peanut oil decreased in hardness by 27%. Okay, so now some of the limitations that are applicable to the study is that after December 15th, the peanut oil decreased by point, I think it was negative 10.4% after a month of being in the fryer. While it is highly unlikely that a, fi a fryer will stay filled with oil for more than 18 days, unless the restaurant doesn't have much business going on or they don't keep up to date with their, um, with their oils. <laughs> um, uh, how we can apply this to the real world? Um, well, from our, our results, we can see that canola oil, canola oil is more likable than peanut as it is cheaper. Um, consumers will often tend to go for the cheaper brands. As a consumer like myself, as a consumer myself, one is never aware of the types of oils, fats, um, chemicals, etc., that are being used to make our food. Mm. To conclude, classic canola oil is one of the healthy, healthiest oils that we can consume. Um, both peanut oil and canola oil have a high monounsaturated ratio that can potentially lower your, lower your LDLs or what's known as bad cholesterol. We can conclude that the French fries um, cooked using both oils were equally, equally liked as there was not much of a difference in taste or sense. Um, canola oil could be potential could be a potential alternative as it is more hearty, heart, heart healthy, and people tend to be allergic to peanuts. Okay. And I think that's it. Thank you.
From these studies, we can see that adding dietary fat to your diet by means of vegetables is the best method to ensure you are getting healthy, unsaturated fats. Increasing foods like fish, avocado, walnuts, and almonds can have a lot of healthy benefits. Throughout the studies, we see that adding omega-3 fatty acids, vitamins can be helpful in the diet. Standard American diet does not get enough. In women, the, the increase in carbs increases TG, LDL, and HDL females only. Canola oil can be used in the food industry instead of peanut oil. This is because it is better for your heart and people can be allergic to peanuts.